Okay. We're live. Um, hello, friends. Uh, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Uh, since 2013, we've been making high quality knowledge accessible, uh, easily accessible, and consumable to leaders anywhere in the world. And for us, the qualification to be a leader was. Uh, is taking a step towards finding solutions to and through ways. It doesn't have to be someone with a leadership position, but anyone anywhere in the world belonging to any community and any point in their lives or professions. Uh, but all they need is uh, to be is to be willing to be able to take a step. And uh, so if not for our work, most of this information would have uh, stayed immobilized or landfilled in lengthy PDFs and uh, limited uh, to expensive international conferences. So we are extremely happy about the impact we've been creating. But um, as you know, this is just a drop in the ocean. But then again, an ocean is just a collection of drops. So uh, the, the, the scale of challenges we face are planetary. And uh, we, have our, we have our battles to fight. We'll have many heroes, successes, and failures. So I request you to get ready to lead and take the next step towards improving life on our precious pale blue dot. For those um, who are not ready yet, um, take your time, and when you're ready, we'll be here to help and guide you take the next step. And I'll be here to help in any other way possible. And uh, B Waste Wise, in addition to just the global dialogue on waste, we also have other programs. One of them is the Waste uh, Pioneers list. Uh, we publish that list every year. And once we publish the list, we also uh, conduct Q&A sessions with the pioneers and also interview series with the uh, pioneers, so we have them published. Uh, they're already being published on the website, so please check them out. And we're also uh, planning a interview weekly interview series with the individual pioneers. That will also be announced soon, so um, follow us and subscribe to the monthly newsletter so that um, you're aware of, um, you're, you're updated. Uh, we also have ongoing Twitter interviews. Uh, you know, you'll find them if you're on Twitter. It's really easy to follow them. And we have something called the community newsletter. So if you've ever been a, a panelist or a contributor to Be Waste Wise, then you could use this community newsletter to um, tell the rest of our uh, large, really large community that um, uh, about your updates, about your um, about any articles that you've written or about any job um, uh, opportunities that um, you might have. So any updates that you have, you can share them through the community uh, newsletter that we send to um, our, our subscribers. And uh, finally, um, I've been um, actively seeking employment. And uh, this has taught me that um, for uh, the waste management sector or circular economy globally, I mean, there is no single platform uh, to be able to search for good jobs. So um, another uh, drop in the ocean is uh, we will help um, uh, so if you have any job opportunities, let us know, and then we'll put them in the newsletter and then send it to uh, the subscribers again. And we'll also put them on uh, the LinkedIn group so that more people can see it and it'll act as a platform for uh, job seekers. Um, you know, this is all a part of uh, um, getting new talent and young talent and uh, better talent into the sector so that, you know, we could make better impact. And um, finally, uh, if you if you like what you're watching and if you think you're learning, then uh, share it, share it with your networks, and that's a simple first step towards change. And if you have questions or comments, you can use the question and answer box on the screen below, or you can tweet with the hashtag waste dialogue. Um, it's spelled as W A S T E D I A L O G uh, hashtag waste dialogue. And depending upon uh, how many questions we have. We have up to 20 minutes for speakers to respond to them. And um, so, yeah, so welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. And uh, coming to today's session, uh, we already have uh, Robert Crocker with us today here. And um, and in, in today's session, going beyond the circular economy, we wanted to begin this, uh, we wanted to use this um, topic to begin the Global Dialogue on Waste. And so that we could contribute uh, to a more robust vision for, for the circular economy. And um, if circular, we believe that if circular economy has to become a new paradigm, new economic paradigm, and remember the if. So if circular economy has to become a new economic paradigm by re replacing our existing models, then um, 
uh, we feel that its uh, current vision is not bold enough uh, because it excludes some of the most important issues of our times like consumption, poverty and inequality and uh, putting a price on uh, pollution. So, um, and, and, but to be fair, those who practice circular economy acknowledge its roots in different schools of thought, all of which deal with uh, living within the means of the planet while regenerating polluted places. But none of those um, have achieved nearly as much traction as circular economy in the last few years. So this is an effort to explore the issues that any movement, um, any current or future movements have to include to be able to create a new economic paradigm for our planet. So with that, um, let me introduce uh, Robert to all of you. Robert um, is the author of uh, uh, Somebody Else's Problem, Consumerism, Sustainability and Design. Um, he was very nice and sent me um, a copy to read and I'm almost done towards the end and in the last chapter. It's an amazing book and um, I, I recommend all of you um, read it um, in some format. So um, Robert, welcome. Um, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Good. I know it's um, really late uh, in Australia, so uh, and you told me you're an early riser, so I'm um, sorry about No, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so one of the issues um, we had with the Global Dialogue on this was we could never have uh, um, the entire planet um, participating in it at once, and um, Australia was always left out. So. Um, this is the first time we have someone from Australia talking on the Global Dialogues on this. So welcome and uh, thanks for representing Australia. Thank you. Thank you. No. So, um, Robert, um, tell me a little bit about yourself, um, you know, about the book, you know, why did you write it and about your work and, you know, so that our listeners get a better idea. Okay. Well, I, um, uh, I'm a historian. Um, I began life as a historian of ideas, actually, of science and ideas. And um, uh, my early book, um, my, my earlier publications, quite a few of them were on ideas about nature in early modern Europe. Um, but about uh, 25 years ago, I became involved through uh, a very serious accident in um, uh, pedestrian advocacy. And um, uh, that has to be the hardest kind of environmental activism I know because pedestrians are not really noticed until they're knocked over or until there's a problem. So trying to persuade people that it's worth creating a city that you can walk around is actually very, very hard. So I spent 10 years struggling um, in that space and um, uh, I can honestly say that at the end I was very pleased because I, those traffic engineers I was tackling with started to sound a bit like me uh, when they were talking about the environment. So they began to understand what I was saying but it, it is very difficult because um, uh, you know what I was really discovering in that in that sort of period of my life, I suppose, was that um, uh, systems like the road system are really blinding. They, they possess us, they lock us in. We become so used to the idea that we have to drive anywhere and everywhere. We usually don't notice the uh, children who can't drive or you know, the elderly people who can't drive and how it um, lowers their quality of life in many cities not to have access to um, those places they really value. And it, it also taught me how um, when a system is so dominant, um, we recognize its values, uh, we recognize its financial worth, its value, but we discount its problems. So we don't really recognize that it has, uh, you know, that it kills. Um, in America, I think the figures are around the same as the number of people killed in the Vietnam War uh, die every year on the roads. Um, in Australia, it's a similar figure. So those sort of figures, nobody jumps up about, uh, up and down about them, really. Uh, we, we treat them as the weather. So I guess that experience really got me used to the idea that systems were very, very powerful. And I soon found myself um, uh, involved in other environmental 
issues because of this and and this also led me to question a lot of what I was reading in the history of design and the history of technology because I was teaching those subjects at the time so so that's really the background of the book um, although later on uh, probably about five years ago I, I was teaching um, uh, a master's of sustainable design and I was responsible for the um, uh, you know, for the theory side, for the history side of the, the course. And um, I felt there was nothing really that I could give my students on consumption that really um, made much sense. So I, that's what really led me to uh, develop this book. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there on consumption, but it, it, it's only in the last few years that it started to, that these uh, sociologists and others have started to talk about the environment. Um, you know, and, and in a way that, that is normal because consumption tends to be separated from the environment. It's not seen as an environmental issue. It's only very recently that people have started talking about the impact of uh, consumption on the environment. So that's really the subject of my book. Yeah, and and the problem that it that this involves. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So um, thank you. So um, well, uh, to begin with, since we're talking about um, a vision for circular economy, so can can you um, talk about um, your vision for um, the future of the planet, and you know what roles do you think um, consumerism and consumption and design play in it? Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, I should probably start by saying I think our present situation is very, very serious. You know, we are in a, a position um, a bit like what my parents' generation went through in 1938. We've been spending, um, since the 1950s really, we've been um, uh, making more stuff uh, more efficiently, more quickly for more people. And um, the, uh, the kind of, um, if you like, uh, the, the effect of this uh, escalating problem, um, you know, is very much a 1938 moment. What I mean is that in 1938, um, everyone in Europe was hoping that nice Mr. Hitler would um, make a deal and uh, calm down and uh, let everyone live in peace and this is ha this never happened and I think in a way we're in this moment where there are people wanting to escape the problem by saying it's not really happening and by saying how you know good it is because there's been a lot of people who are now uh, no longer in extreme poverty who were in extreme poverty but to me this is really avoiding uh, the issue we have very very dramatic material changes uh, driven by technology and by industrial efficiency producing uh, so much uh, so much material um, we also have uh, scientific changes which are very dramatic and um, we also have uh, an environmental crisis which is becoming more and more um, uh, disturbing you know physically to the planet so Given that background, I feel that, uh, I mean, in my, my life, my, my, my position, I suppose, is that everyone has to do the best they can with what they have. And I'm the sort of person that I enjoy research, I enjoy writing. So rather than going out there carrying banners and um, trying to get politicians to listen, I'm trying to use my... Uh, my, my, my skill as a writer to at least make people more aware of this problem. I suppose I, I slightly differ with you, you know, in your opening statement in that I feel that, um, you know, looking for solutions is very, very important. And, you know, I'm surrounded by very clever people who come up with some solutions in certain areas, you know, and they can be very specific scientific ones technological ones, but I'm very concerned that uh, we have to really face this, this, this uh, elephant in the room of consumption. And uh, when we talk about the circular economy, um, 
it's certainly very, very important that uh, Rolls Royce and big companies uh, do things with their their industrial processes to make them more efficient and less wasteful. That's very important. But until we start looking at everyday life and behavior and throwaway things and fast moving things, uh, the systems we live with like cars, you know, um, transport systems, communication systems, all these are things that we tend to sort of treat as though they're out of bounds because they're making people a lot of money. And um, my view is these things have to change. And there's, there's a very important role for government and for policymakers in this as well. Uh, but until you understand the extent of the system and are really willing to spend a bit of time thinking about it and how it um, has been internalized since the 1950s, um, it, I, I'm, I, what I'm worried about is we'll continue focusing upon glamorous individuals with big ideas who promise to change the world rather than talking to people in, say, Jakarta who, you know, are dealing with waste, you know, like one of my PhD students, um, you know, who are actually seeing, you know, the kind of uh, um, the result of all this consumption and the kind of problems we have. So for me, the circular economy is a good start. That's what I'll say. <laughs> um, so, um, so in terms of... Right. Uh, the, yeah, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, well, I think the circular economy is 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 a, a very important start. And um, but uh, what I would like to do is to remind everyone involved in the circular economy that while you can put little boxes up that say consumption, uh, you know, say production, consumption, and waste, it's very important to put between those boxes uh, the market. What is the market doing with that material? Uh, going from production to consumption. Uh, what, are the, what are changes in prices? Because price comes into this a lot. Uh, one, of the, uh, great, uh, one of the insights of the great uh, economist um, Stanley Jevons in the 19th century was to recognise that when you produce um, uh, more, when, when you make a system more efficient, you tend to lower costs and this will generate more consumption. And, you know, we, we sort of understand this, but what, what happens when everyone is actually trying to help that system produce more stuff for more people? You end up with things like the throwaway coffee cup. What is it, 500 billion perhaps? We don't have accurate figures, but 500 billion a year uh, just for saving a few minutes on your way to work or whatever where it's very easy to bring your own or just to use the ceramic cup and stand at the bar as they do in Italy. So that sort of thing, um, okay, we can, we can recycle it, we can create technologies to uh, separate the plastic from the paper, but um, the, the issue really is, is it worth cutting down all those forests um, and taking all that water to make something um, so wasteful and so uh, irresponsible, really. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my question, I suppose. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, this actually uh, r reminds me of um, a quote uh, that I heard in a TED talk from, I think, Janice Potochnik, um, where he says that, um, and I also found the Nature article he was referring to, which says that um, consumption and uh, consumption per capita consumption rate and um, uh, population growth are the two major drivers which drive all other anthropogenic changes on, on the planet and which is why uh, we believe you know talking about consumption is so important because no one else is doing that um, and um, so so in your book you say that our consumption and our impact on the planet are dictated mostly by systems so this is something which might um, come as a uh, you know shock to many activists who are doing work you know trying to change behaviors and trying to change personal habits so, but in your book you very clearly uh, say that most of our impact are dictated by systems and infrastructure and not by individual behavior um, and you also I, I think I believe you say even if you're the greenest person even if you're a sage um, you would still have a significant impact on the environment because of how your systems and infrastructure are already set up. So in, in such a situation, um, 
what's the role of the individual then? You know, how do they engage with the systems and how, how do they, you know, bring about change? Well, I guess, I guess I should explain that this book in a way was partly written for my students. Um, and they, uh, these are young professional designers, lovely people. They come from all over the world, um, South America, America, Canada, um, you know, and so for the last 10 years I've been teaching these students and one of the things that really struck me when uh, they came to me was they had all uh, sort of swallowed the idea that, um, you know, if they just designed greener stuff, things would change and things would get better and everything would be okay. So, you know, I, I wanted, I was aiming uh, the book to some extent of them, but I'm also very much concerned that Turning um, individuals into heroes, consumption heroes, is a bad idea because what it does is it distracts us from systems. That doesn't mean that the individual is not important. You know, it doesn't mean that we are helpless. You know, um, in fact, I really think that everyone can make a difference uh, because, um, you know, even if you, you know, e even if you don't have um, you know, if you use your skills, if you use what you have, you can make a difference in your life in all kinds of ways. But when it comes to consumption, um, you know, if you look at, say you take the four or five um, kind of areas that people interact with systems in their homes, you know, things like electricity and power and gas, etc., they don't usually determine where these come from, yeah? Transport. Um, often they're stuck, you know, if they're living in a suburb or, uh, you know, they're often stuck with whatever's available, you know. Um, food, you know, supermarkets. Um, you know, you might be a wealthy person who can make a lot of choices, but most people in the world can't, yeah. And things like shopping and clothing, that again is largely determined by systems, yeah. So those four areas when you look at the individual, the way that, that um, the individual's consumption then adds to other individuals' consumptions within the same kind of uh, context, you know, like say you have 10 houses in a street, um, you might have somebody who really consciously tries to do the right thing, you know, out of those 10 houses um, and might uh, you know, reduce them, their, you know, but if they stay on the grid and they behave like normal people, they go to work and they do all the rest of it, probably they'll get to about 20% difference, you know, unless of course you become a monk and you don't interact with anyone and you just withdraw, you know, <laughs> and then to some extent you can, you know, you can probably go much further. But for most of us with children, with, with responsibilities, this is very hard. And I actually question whether your time is, is better spent ringing your MP or your congressman, uh, trying to get engaged with others in changing these systems, in trying to change politically a system that tends to encourage overconsumption and waste. So, you know, that that's really my... Um, I'm also very concerned about um, the messaging that tends to be, uh, you know, that was very popular for about 10 years, where big companies would say, you know, um, all you need to do is this, uh, you know, and big charities as well, all you need to do is ride a bike and everything will be different. I actually ride a bike, but it hasn't changed the world, you know. <laughs> I really enjoy riding my bike, but it's not, it's not going to, it, you know, it gives me health and I enjoy it and I, you know, I, I use it a lot. And Doesn't it my, take time uh, yeah. and a lot of people doing it to, to create change though? I mean. Well, yes, I think, um, I think what happens is that when you get enough people who recognize there's a problem, they start to push, you know, and the push is the really important thing. What, I, what I'm really against, and this is very important for designers to understand, is blaming individuals for not being green enough, yeah? Because what tends to happen is when green becomes very trendy, you imagine you can change the world and, uh, 
you don't really recognize that often some of the poorest people are the ones most locked in. You know, they're the ones who are kind of forced to shop in the supermarket. You know, they live miles from anywhere where there's no public transport, so they have to drive the old car, you know, the smoky old car, you know. So it's it's kind of, um, you know, like I, you know, I travel a lot and, you know, you get on a, a rickshaw in, in Delhi, you know, and those guys suffer so much, you know, they have such a hard life. Um, you know, they have to accept what the systems give them. And I think this you'll find this all over the world. That's why I'm very, very wary of blaming individuals and also because I think it tends to divert people from the importance of systems, yeah? So that's really what I'm, I'm trying to get at. And I think for waste managers, it's really obvious because you're, you know, you're, you're looking at this mountain. It's a bit like you're standing in a street and somebody above you, it's a bit like a medieval town, you know, people above you are pouring buckets of slops over you, you know, <laughs> and you're standing there saying, hey, I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to clean it up. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, all right. right. Yeah. So that's, yeah, right. that's what I was um, <laughs> Right, no, that, that makes sense. So um, you don't want um, the messaging to get diluted by distractions and, you know, focus on um, problems which could create um, a greater impact, I guess. I mean, uh, and... Um, and can, I, can I just finish? What, I was, what I'm really arguing for is that a focus on the individual tends to encourage more consumption. Uh, con green consumerism as well. That's another point um, because um, really, if you're going to be really serious, you recognize that there's no such thing as a perfectly green object. What we do is with green things, we measure them against benchmarks um, that are greener. You know, so for example, a green car uh, is no longer a Prius. Ten years ago, a green car was a Prius. Now a green car is a Tesla, you know. Um, in 10 years' time, it'll be something else, maybe a hydrogen car, you know. So what I'm saying is that they all have a footprint. They all have uh, environmental costs, you know, resource costs, water costs. Um, so, you know, that what we have to do is stop competing and understand and just try and just calmly look at the problem and the scale of it. And it is massive. It's a planetary scale problem, yeah, as you said. <laughs> Um, thank you. <laughs> so, um, um, well, one one um, clarification. So, Professor Carl Zimring from uh, Pratt Institute says that the greenest car now is the zip car um, because you can share share it. Um, a lot of people can share the same um, infrastructure. Um, but um, what you're talking about also reminded me of uh, another panel that we're going to have um, later in the in this dialogue um, on uh, collective action. And there we have uh, two um, activists, Olivia Lapierre and Chanel Crosby, who will be talking about the lack of representation of um, populations which will be most affected by, you know, uh, these uh, changes that we're, the environmental changes that we're going through, and how it's extremely easy, and how zero waste movements are um, um, mostly represented by people who could make choices like who are wealthy enough, who are privileged enough to be able to make choices and change their lifestyles accordingly. But then they believe that they're not completely represented by people who need to so that they can be more resilient towards change. So uh, that that's that. But um, I want to get to the next question because uh, we only have another uh, 15 minutes. Um, so, we, you know, time flies by really fast when, you know, you're having a good discussion. So in, in, in the book, um, you talk about your dad's lifestyle. Hmm. Your dad yes. would be the age of my grandfather, so I think their age uh, was more circular, you say in the book, or sustainable because uh, products and services were expensive and not affordable to many. Um, so, so considering sustainable development goals, if the if the prices of materials and services are high, then we'll not be able to address poverty uh, because back then many people were also very poor. Um, so, and but if the same prices are low, uh, then it increases consumption and therefore our absolute environmental, our total environmental impact. So, 
um, how should we think about this problem? Should we just um, keep the, like, I mean, sh should the prices just be high? Um, and you know, keep all of these people out of the system. Uh, like, how should I, I mean? It's a paradox. I mean, as a you know human being, I cannot think of a place where I would want you know many people to live in poverty just so that. Um, well, I, I would end there. But how should I think about this? You know, um, you've worked on this for so long. So, can you help me? Um, well, I should just say my father was a pretty extraordinary guy. He died at a hundred, uh, born in 1902, brought up on a a little, well, a farm, quite a, uh, you know, most farms in Australia are large by, you know, European standards. But, you know, he didn't have electricity, uh, you know, everything was horse drawn. So then he moved into the 20th century. And um, by the time he died, there was uh, computers and a lot of things he didn't understand. But um, why I sort of bring him into my book is that I see sustainable consumption as, uh, you know, in, in a way it's an extension of my argument around systems that our behavior is very much conditioned by what we're used to. He grew up uh, and his formative years were during a lot of economic hardship, you know, in the 20s and 30s. So he saw, um, uh, you know, he, I, I call him in the book a um, custodial consumer because uh, you know, he, one of his favorite sayings was caveat emptor, you know, buy, beware. Um, <laughs> so he he didn't see, uh, you know, he saw possessions as uh, things that you had some responsibility for. You know, he would darn his own socks, you know, this sort of thing, which people uh, don't do now, or some people do, but very few. So, you know, he would never throw anything away unless it was really broken. So, you know, to me, it's uh, that kind of consumption in a way, we need a bit more of that, you know, to, um, uh, you know, but what you're saying in a way about um, the sustainable development goals, my concern, uh, probably like uh, those of your, your activist guests later, is that, um, you know, the, what we seem to be doing is we're, we're, we're kind of in a way enriching uh, one part of the world at, at the expense of another in a kind of a, um, uh, you know, that the, well, well, the issue with sustainable consumption is that if we keep making things faster and faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper, we're not necessarily making the things we really need. Um, we're not necessarily making the things that will last and will be useful to us. So I think there's a, there's a sort of a middle ground between the two extreme sort of scenarios you or arguments in a way that you present, presented in your question. Um, uh, for example, um, if you look at uh, a lot of the everyday things in the supermarket now, a lot of them are very cheap, uh, fast moving products that are deliberately engineered to last for very short periods of time. What they're trying to do is to make sure that you go back many times and you engage in many transactions. You know, like um, I've got a, you know, my dad and people older than me always used to have razors that lasted maybe 10 years or so. They might change the blades every few weeks, but the blades could then be recycled. Now, uh, most people buy these little plastic ones that are disposable or that will last a very short period of time. Shaving foam uh, used to come in a, a block, you know, and um, that would, I still, I still use this, that lasts six months. Uh, you know, the, the stuff in the cans will last maybe two weeks. So you, you find yourself going back and throwing these things away. Um, they're not actually that cheap, but they're being engineered to encourage um, repeat purchase um, and they're doing this because they they are allowed to externalize wastes they're allowed to uh, and to externalize res the, the real cost of resources so you know my my concern is that economically um, we will need a lot of changes to implement a genuinely circular economy um, especially in these kinds of domains um, you know, th we can't really afford to allow um, uh, manufacturers to uh, to do this sort of thing in you know 
without any end because they will find more things to, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, tea bags, um, you know, tea bags are relatively new. They might save you a minute, but the taste of the tea is not as good, but they managed to turn a $10 commodity into a $100 commodity for the, for the manufacturer. It's the same with coffee pods. You know, you buy loose coffee like I do and you put it on the little stove top and you make your coffee and it tastes good. You get uh, coffee pods, it might taste slightly better. I don't know, you know, but the, uh, and it might save you a minute, but in the end, it's turned what you could buy for $10 into something that you pay $150 for. So there's sort of a, it's not a simple, um, it's not, it's not as though if you make these changes, you're automatically denying poor people, uh, you know, the right to consume. Uh, in fact, you may be saving them because you might be making it harder for people to go and prey on them with, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken or very cheap things, you know, that aren't necessarily very good for them. Does that make sense? I don't know whether I'm making much sense of this. It's quite a complicated topic and I'm and uh, it's quite late here as you know so <laughs> um, uh, no, uh, it makes sense to me and um, uh, uh, you're also uh, touching on something which is being sustainable could also you know um, be more um, affordable and I think that kind of relates to um, putting a price on pollution and uh, we have Dominic Hogg who will be joining us after this um, he's already here with us so um, I think we'll talk about that uh, but um, I understand what you're saying, and um, so for for uh, listeners, um, just wanted to remind you that uh, uh, questions you can um, submit them with uh, using the Q and A um, box below, and um, you're watching the Beyond the Circular Economy theme. Uh, for, for those who who just joined, you're watching Robert Crocker. Um, and we have Dominic Hogg um, starting in about uh, seven minutes. And um, so, uh, Robert. So, since we have just uh, we left with just seven minutes, could you um, so could could you maybe summarize or conclude, you know, um, uh, this panel, and then talk about what should decision makers, what should business leaders? Um, since you said um, you got good reception from business leaders for your book, and that. Um, and congratulations on the ISWA Publication Award. Um, I think that's great. So, um, yeah. so, 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 because of this, so can you um, summarize and then give some suggestions to um, or guide decision makers on what they should do? You know, think, how they should. Think, do um, yeah, I think uh, what I haven't talked about much is design and the role of design. Um, I think the role of design is critical, but my view is that as I was trying to. Uh, explain is that the problem is very complex and involves many different uh, players you know and um, that's why in the end of my book the chapter you haven't read actually is is basically all about collaboration and the importance of collaboration and I talk about what I call post-cautionary products um, I use the toothbrush as an example um, it's fantastic object uh, actually napoleon had one you know and, and it's still there in a museum um, but the plastic toothbrush 1938 uh, you know was a, a great success in business terms but when something is very very successful it becomes a legacy and the legacy can uh, in a sense have uh, a lot of environmental problems you know we produce four billion of them um, you know, and this will probably rise to seven or eight in the next 10 years. Uh, most of them aren't uh, recycled. They don't recycle easily anyway. Um, how are we going to make a better one? Now, if you just talk to, this is what I say in the last chapter, if you just are going to talk to chemists, um, plastic people, uh, you know, and the corporations, they will tend to make one that's slightly more recyclable. And they'll say, oh, we fixed it. Um, but they haven't because it's still getting into the water, it's still getting into the soil, um, and it's got a life, you know, that goes on forever. So, or, you know, another hundred years or something. So we need to, um, you know, and that's why in a way uh, I emphasize the importance of design-led collaboration, design co-creation, 
because a lot of these are wicked problems. They're not, um, you know, you can't solve them on your own. You can't, you know, get some Steve Jobs to come in and go, oh, it's all going to change, you know. It doesn't, you know. It's not, it's not about individual genius, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas a designer is trying, yeah, so... Sorry. <laughs> um, no, um, that sounds good. We have one question which says, so should we, um, uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Mr. Welusami, and then um, he asks whether we should focus on recyclable products, since you mentioned recyclable products. Well, I think recycling is, is a, um, can be very important in certain areas, but recycling is, again, um, complicated. Some things... Uh, are very easy to recycle, like glass, even though very expensive to recycle, and and yet they don't really hurt the environment very much. Paper is, you know, relatively easy, but there are some things we don't recycle, which we it would be nice if we could, like textiles. Um, you know, we recycle far too few, and they're full of uh, chemicals that have, you know, environmental problems associated with them. Uh, plastics are another nightmare. So, so in a sense, recyclability or reusability is is very important. But even better is to make things that last longer and can be used longer um, in use. You know, and uh, even if they are a bit more expensive and they last longer, but finding the economic um, way of making these things popular, that is another problem. I'll have to write another book on that. <laughs> it's, not, it's not an easy thing to discuss in a few minutes, yeah? But no. recycling is important, but perhaps not as important. It's not the solution a lot of people imagine it to be, yeah? Take my coffee cup, you know, it's a, the, you know, the throwaway coffee cup. In theory, you can recycle it. But in Australia, um, it's not recycled, it's just buried, yeah? Right, um, which right. is a problem. <laughs> um, I hope in your next book you um, uh, not just write it for students, but also all of us. And uh, <laughs> so, um, so w w with that, I think, uh, Robert, uh, thanks so much. Do you have any final concluding remarks? We have just one minute. Well, I just wanted to thank you very much for um, putting up with me for 45 minutes. I, I feel um, uh, very pleased to uh, be able to talk to you because it's nice to actually try and explain what my book is about. I think uh, some people, uh, I think on a whole, it's had quite a good reception. Um, I think some people expected me to come up with solutions, more solutions, but really the whole uh, purpose of the book was to say, well, the problem is very big and very complicated and has very deep roots, roots, historical roots, behavioral roots, technological roots. And that's, and in a sense, my, my understanding of solutions is they, they follow problems. So when you understand a problem well enough, the solution will appear. So that's why I think understanding the problem is, you know, in a sense, uh, very, very valuable. So that's that's why I've sort of structured that book in the way that I have, you know, so. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you anyway, Ranjit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, great. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. I mean, um, and um, we're really glad to, uh, to, uh, to have you um, to be able to discuss this um, topic over such a long time. And uh, that's the reason we changed the format so that, you know, we have enough time with each speaker for 45 minutes. And these days, I mean, um, all the uh, discussion and all, uh, all the media consumption is, you know, bite-sized and, you know, it just kind of makes the uh, dialogue more extreme. So, you know, this format was just to make sure that, you know, we have an we have an opportunity to talk and, you know, exchange ideas with, you know, bright minds. So thank you very much for joining us and... Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, have a good night. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I will. Right. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye for now. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Robert. Bye. 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 Um, we have um, Dominic here. Um, Dominic Hogg from Unomia Research. Uh, let me just unmute him. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, now he's unmuted. Hey, Dominic, can you hear us? Uh, can you hear me? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thanks, Dominic, for joining us. It's a pleasure. Yeah, good to see yeah. you. How are you? Yeah, very good to see you again. Um, can you put the, yeah, yeah, the, um, a little further down? Sorry? Put the camera. Right there. Uh, can you put the camera further down? Yeah. Okay. So um, let me um, just introduce you and then um, give an introduction to the topic. And um, friends, so um, initially when we started the uh, discussion, there were some technical problems. So some of you might ha not have heard the introduction, but um, let me just um, say that uh, we believe, um, so the, the reason we, we, we're talking about going beyond a circular economy is, uh, you know, uh, has to become a new, economic paradigm and uh, we should remember the if so if circular economy has to become a new economic paradigm by replacing our existing models then we believe that um, its current vision is not bold enough include some of the most important issues of our times like consumption which we just discussed with um, uh, robert poverty and inequality and uh, being able to put up price on pollution so um that we are now and when it comes to the uh, down now and and when it comes to the uh, format um, today we have a slight uh, change in schedule so uh, Alexander Lemel's uh, uh, panel is uh, has been pre-recorded because uh, he couldn't make uh, this time um, and we really wanted his uh, views on, on the topic so it's pre-recorded and I'll send the email to everyone with a link to that um, uh, discussion <coughs> with uh, Dominic's uh, discussion so um thank you Dominic, for joining us. and uh um and again sorry <laughs> sorry so to go back to the viewers so if you have any questions or comments use the hashtag waste dialogue and use the q a box um at the top of uh, at the bottom of your screen and uh depending upon how many questions we have we'll have about 20 minutes for dom to answer them towards the end of this discussion so with that, um, Dominic, welcome again. Um, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work, about yourself? You know, how did you get into this sector? How did you... Yeah, well, good to see you again. Last time I think yeah. we were in New York together. So um, uh, thanks for setting this up. And hello to everybody who's uh, um, managed to get online to, to listen. So I, my uh, involvement, I mean, I used to be sort of, um, I used to play quite a lot of sport, and um, I used to. Uh, uh, my brother was a very good sportsman. He was a very good rugby player, and I uh, was sort of following in his footsteps. And then I had quite a serious injury at the age of 21. Uh, I almost died from a ruptured spleen, and uh, I was told by the surgeon I had to stick to Tiddlywinks. So I needed to find something better to do, and I think I did. <laughs> so. Uh, I, um, I started to get involved in a lot of environmental campaigns, mainly, mainly at the time around tropical forest issues. Uh, I was teaching at the time. I gave that up to do a master's degree, which was around um, food policy and commodity trade. And uh, I then did a PhD at the University of Cambridge around the economics of technical change on uh, um, particularly focused on sea technologies and the role of biotechnology in potentially constraining genetic diversity in agriculture. And that still remains quite a strong passion of mine. Um, but one way or another, I ended up in a, in a consultancy and I now chair a company called Unomia, uh, which I set up 16 years ago. We now have around uh, 70, 75 staff in you, uh, in London, Manchester, Brussels, um, Copenhagen, New York, and we have a, a small office in Auckland as well in New Zealand. And well, our main emphasis is on waste and resource issues, but also low carbon energy, um, sustainable business, particularly around supporting circular economy type models and resource efficiency, and also um, issues around natural capital and marine pollution, particularly marine plastic pollution, which we've uh, done quite a lot of work on recently.
All right, great. Um, so uh, also congratulations on your um, setting up of a new office in the US. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, great. So uh, let so so you got into um, all of this because you had nothing better to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to find something better to do. And being a, a, a sort of beer swilling rugby player, so uh, um, yeah, it's probably done wonders for my liver as well as for my uh, <laughs> general state of well-being. But uh, yes, I um, that's how I came into. Uh, becoming a, a consultant as I am now. <laughs> Great, wonderful. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> by the way, by the way, I should say, my my PhD thesis, perhaps not coincidentally, uh, was uh, strongly related to this issue of path dependence and the, the nature of choice, and the fact that, as the Greek philosopher Heraclitus once said, you never step into the same river twice. And uh, I, it, it affects a lot of what I do. I think we we can we make choices and we can't always unmake them because they're uh, very different. But equally, fate deals us some interesting uh, blows at times, and uh, I think we have to make the most of them. Right, right. No, oh, I, in that case, um, if we're talking about history, I think uh, Robert was a historian. Is a historian, so you would have had a great chat with him. I would have. Um, and um, one of the things that led to this, um, um, to inviting you was we met um, at the UN uh, Marine Plastics Conference and you were on the stage, you um, had a chance to speak, but it was just 15 minutes and there were like six other people who were all really good again. So um, I felt like we couldn't really hear a lot from you. So, you know, I thought maybe in this way, you know, we actually have some time, you know, good 45 minutes to be able to discuss different issues and, you know, go in depth. So uh, thanks for accepting. And uh, so let's start with uh, what circular economy. Um, how do you um, how do you differentiate them it from you know other environmental concepts and movements? Uh, so maybe we could start with that. Well, I suppose I mean you know a lot of people will say well this is nothing new, and uh, and I think there's some truth in that. But obviously there's been a resurgence, should we say, in interest in the concept of the circular economy. Um, it's what's been interesting about this sort of uh, aggressive uptake, if you like, of the circular economy over the last um, decade, I suppose, is that I think the profile of the concept has been raised and that's been really helpful. Um, I also think it's become uh, very clear that uh, the role of design, and I heard Robert talking about that earlier, um, becomes sort of centre stage. I think there's a there's some truth in the fact that when we've been talking about waste and resources, that there's been too much uh, by way of um, assuming that we simply have to deal with the waste as it comes to us. But of course, that's not true. And uh, if we start to emphasise and place um, push greater responsibility towards those who are uh, designing the things we consume. And I think um, we have a better opportunity to ensure that what consumption we do um, engage in is of a more sustainable nature. I think, uh, uh, so I think the circular economy has, has been very useful in, 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 in pressing that forward. Is it radically different? I, I'm not so sure. I think, um, uh, you know, we, it, 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 it's, um, it's important, obviously, that we, we, it, it feels to me as though it embraces a lot of other concepts and um, uh, that, that we could describe in the environmental movement. We have various uh, people talking about resource efficiency, factor four, cradle to cradle, biomimicry and so forth. And indeed, the circular economy draws on all of those. Um, does it, is, is it entirely uh, consistent with all of those? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, right, I mean, uh, to be fair, um, practitioners of circular economy acknowledge its roots in you know, different schools of thought. And um, all of which, um, all of those different, uh, different schools of thought deal with um, you know, living within the means of the planet while yeah. you know, regenerating polluted places. Uh, but uh, um, like, like you mentioned, you know, none of those um, have achieved nearly as much traction as circular economy. Which has been really useful um, for you know everyone working in the sector. 
Um, so, uh, and uh, in, in this, so in our efforts to probably add to what's already existing in the circular economy so that, you know, it could be a, um, we can piggyback, kind of piggyback on the traction that's already there. You know, we're just hoping that we could add. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so, right. I mean, I, I think we could have quite an academic discussion about exactly where one ends and one concept ends and another begins. But I think the important thing is to galvanise some action because the, you know, the problems that are confronting us are, are pretty huge, and yeah. uh, and unless we really start to grapple with them, um, then frankly we're all. Um, uh, <laughs> we're all in going to be facing a huge crisis in the future and I think well I say in the future I think we already are in one and uh, so so um, so I think uh, whatever means can be used to probably engage people in this discussion and uh, not just in discussion but actually translating that into action is to be welcomed and frankly let's face it we, we have nowhere near enough action now <laughs> No, uh, no, totally. I agree. Um, I mean, uh, this has been very helpful to us, uh, given the enormity of our uh, challenges that we face today. So, um, uh, so talking about being practical and you know getting into action, uh, getting to act. Um, so, and coming back to the topic today. So, uh, is is a price on pollution like carbon pricing possible? You know, if it is, uh, who will be the key stakeholders that will make it happen? And you know, how do you think it could be implemented? Um, and is it happening? And I think um, it's happening in different countries through generally through emissions trading schemes. And those emissions trading schemes are mostly trying to ensure that there is a, a means to which they can be made compatible with each other. So it's not impossible to imagine a global trading scheme of sorts. Um, I suppose one of the uh, issues with some some of the trading schemes out there, and of course they vary just. In, in scope and design is uh, first of all the scope which in which activities which industries are included and which are not and also the uh, the extent to which where they are what are called cap and trade models and they set an absolute um, uh, an overall quota within which people have to remain in terms of their trading um, whether those quotas are anywhere near tight enough and of course uh, the Paris Agreement ought to be helping to I suppose tighten the caps that are implemented in the different emissions trading schemes that are there but the other thing I think that's quite important we live in a globalized world and um, obviously there's an interesting discussion about uh, how countries deal with and report on their emissions of greenhouse uh, gases. And under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, reporting under the waste chapter, is very narrowly focused on effectively landfill and bio waste treatment. And so the, the role that better resource management can play in uh, addressing the overall level of emissions um, associated with resource consumption is somehow obscured. Uh, and let me give an example of that, or I'll give a couple of examples. So for example, if, if I'm a major importing country and the United Kingdom is one, then actually much of the uh, emissions associated with what I'm actually consuming are not happening within the country. They're not associated with production within the United Kingdom. But of course, our inventories that we report to the, to the UN are based around the activities of production within our country. Um, so we don't see um, some of the impacts of consumption because those emissions are effectively taking place in other countries. Now, of course, that's fine if, if lots of those other countries have their own uh, emissions performance standards and quotas to achieve. But if they don't, we're, they're effectively slipping outside of our, our, our sight. And the second example would be um, where a country starts to engage in recycling. And again, I'll use the, the example of the UK. Suppose I'm importing primary 
aluminium from a country like Brazil, um, the emissions don't appear on my inventory uh, because the, they've been, the production has taken place elsewhere. If on the other hand I start to recycle here in the UK and I see the recycling happening in a, an aluminium smelting plant in the northwest of the UK, then I have some emissions that I'm going to record within my inventory. And so my, my inventory has worsened, but actually in terms of global climate change emissions, I may have replaced an activity that generated 10 tonnes of CO2 with one that generates maybe half or one. And so, you know, the, the, the magnitude of the, the benefit isn't captured within the inventory. So what, what does that mean? It means unless we get to a system where we do have a global form of carbon pricing, uh, we're likely to be in some difficulty vis-a-vis -vis climate change. And then most of the materials when we're recycling, we know that generally one of the effects is that we reduce energy in certain margin. We ought to see uh, less greenhouse gas being generated. So what, what I'm concerned about is that if we don't capture the embodied emissions in our consumption, and if we don't actually price those into uh, to what we're doing, um, then we have a real problem. And so I think we can we can go two ways with this. We can wait until um, the uh, global community puts in place, should we say, a global trading scheme. Or if we want, we could switch back. And I say switch back because many countries have considered this and um, but we've tended to end up more with emissions trading schemes and taxes. But I think the move back to a tax-based system. And the reason why I think the tax-based system might be better is that I think we might be in a situation where we can better adjust for the carbon content of imports and exports as they move across country borders. And so if, for example, Going back to my example, we're, we're importing a lot of primary material into the UK. Um, I think we should tax the embodied carbon content of that import. Um, presumably, if we were to do that, we would also see a lower tax on imports where the embodied carbon content was lower, where, for example, the product was made of recycled material. And so we're fostering, if you like, a uh, the economy going more circular by implementing a form of pricing that reflects the embodied carbon content of what we are producing. Right. So um, <coughs> you're suggesting um, something similar to a carbon tax, or maybe that that is the definition for a carbon tax. Yeah, I think I think um, you, Another way you could imagine this and conceive of this, particularly in a country like ours, as I say, where we're importing a lot of um, primary materials and, and so forth, is you could actually, in the interim, you could link the carbon price, the tax level that you were going to um, set to the sort of prices that were being um, realised in the market for carbon allowances in the trading scheme. But the problem with that is those prices are going up and down all the time because they're traded prices, much like commodities. And so it's very difficult to sort of fix a particular um, rate at which you might be from one day to, to another, uh, which you might be taxing the embodied and, uh, carbon content of, of materials. So I think, you know, as long as we don't have a global scheme, and I'm not sure that we've really got time enough to wait and just see whether that might materialize. As long as we don't have that, then I think it would, seems to me incumbent, particularly on the more sort of developed um, economies, to actually consider how they can actually take into account the, the embodied carbon content of whatever it is that they're consuming. Right, and, and um, given um given what we're talking um it seems like there is this um huge difference um well uh, i mean we know that there is a huge difference on how 
developed countries can act on certain issues and uh, how the developing countries can act on certain issues. And you were talking about how um, the emissions are just being um, uh, transported from one place to, uh, you know, a uh, poorer place where, you know, most of the production could happen to make the goods cheaper. So um, coming to that um, issue, so uh, we have a question from Harijan Das who asks that, who asks, um, what do you think is um, happening de in developing countries when it comes to um, circular economy? Um, and, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, how are they, how, how is the concept or how are these concepts being taken up and you know, what kind of KPIs or uh, KPI performance indicators are, are they using? I mean, uh, do you think? Uh, okay, interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to claim to be an expert here. Um, in terms of what's happening uh, in, in many of the developing countries. I, I know something, but um, I'm, I'm by no means uh, an expert. So a few comments that um, might be appropriately caveated, should we say. First of all, I think it's, you know, from, from certainly from what I know and from what I've um, seen in, in some countries, uh, the role of the informal sector is very important in, in developing countries in terms of capturing materials for recycling. Uh, they tend to be the people who are doing that recycling in the, in the early days. Um, uh, the, the other thing is that consumption levels tend to be obviously somewhat lower. And, um, and when we look at the types of waste that's being generated, interestingly, we tend to find higher quantities of sort of wet organic waste um, that seem to be generated in those in those countries. In, in terms of where the circular economy is going, um, which bit I guess is what we could say, I think, um, and it's incredibly difficult, I, I, I would suggest to, to, to entirely generalise about that, but we've um, got uh, vast differences in levels of consumption. Uh, we have um, many companies playing quite important roles there. Um, it's interesting to note, obviously, that uh, some of the developed countries who are collecting materials for recycling are exporting them to, to uh, developing countries, often for reprocessing. So there's a there's a sort of almost like a, um, a trade link going on in terms of how secondary materials are being extracted and utilised. Um, it's lots of things we could talk about, about um, right. different aspects of this. In terms of what businesses are doing, it's an interesting one because uh, I think um, we see, I, I've certainly seen some very interesting cases of major uh, corporations um, looking very closely at the quality of their industrial processes and trying to make those fairly efficient. Um, on the other hand, in terms of how can we uh, make sure going forward that our uh, economies in, in, in the, that the developing economies are driven more circular, one of the things that has worried me is the um, attention being given to uh, shifting simply out of landfill and into energy from waste incineration and so forth. Um, my concern with uh, that is that um, the, 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 the climate change imperative that it seems to me is looming large over many much of what we do uh, suggests that that might not be a particularly good solution going forward. Um, the reason I say that is that to the extent that there's a you know, reasonable plastic component of waste that's being combusted, that plastic component has a fossil carbon element which is liberated more or less instantaneously into the atmosphere, so it gives rise to fossil CO2 emissions. And uh, yes, we might get some energy back. Typically in the developing countries, I suspect it's more likely to be electricity than heat in many of them. And the thing is that what I notice happening in several of the developing countries, they're recognizing that the, one of the cheapest forms of energy generation now, electricity generation, is going to be solar. And so at the margin, we're putting in place something that's quite a 
kind of an intense form of energy generation at a time when there's an increasing recognition that some of the lowest cost forms of energy are zero carbon ones. And um, I go back to the point I was making earlier about how countries are reporting to the UN under the waste chapter. And if all you're reporting is principally emissions from landfills, it looks as though you're doing a great job just by taking waste away from landfills and putting them into incineration plants. But of course, those emissions should be reported under the stationary combustion chapter of the IP uh, under the, the UN reporting framework. And we often lose that when we're, when we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions from waste management. We end up only looking at the chapter five emissions that are reported under that chapter called waste, which are almost exclusively directed towards landfilling. Right, no, no, it makes sense. Um, I mean, um, uh, I think every country goes through so many priorities and climate change being one, one of the biggest, but um, we also have priorities to reduce toxicity in our you know, overall production systems and also reduce consumption overall. I mean, uh, these seem to be, uh, you know, one of the top priorities for us, you know, for our plan moving forward, at least looking from a um, production and um, raw materials perspective. Um, so uh, let's let's get to the uh, next topic. Uh, this is something to deal with uh, the timelines because when, when we are talking about, um, uh, I mean, I've been in many conferences and meetings and then whenever we talk about um, issues like this, we often, um, miss, uh, we, we often don't address the short term, long term and medium term impacts of uh, different decisions we take. Um, and uh, you know, and not just that, but also the short, medium and long term priorities that we have, uh, you know, as as a as the local priorities, national and global priorities that we have. I mean, these seem to always be um, ignored in many discussions. So um, putting that putting like in that context. So how, how do you think a price on pollution um, impacts uh, the circular economy and sectors like waste management, which are very much connected to, you know, um, moving towards a circular economy? What do you think the short, medium and, you know, long term uh, impacts are on, on this concept for price on pollution? Uh, like you mentioned, a carbon tax. Okay, um, I mean, it's there are very few countries who've included waste within the emissions trading scheme. And I think possibly New Zealand is just one of one of the small number that has done. Um, the it, there's different ways again of doing this. In, in most countries, um, uh, in, in the European Union. Virtually every country now, with the exception of Luxembourg, Slovakia, and Germany, has a landfill tax. And those landfill taxes vary from quite low levels, a few euros per tonne, to the one here in the UK and the one that has been in place in the Netherlands, which are approaching, depending on the exchange rate, um, approaching 100 euros per tonne. And those those are interesting instruments they don't they, they, they are basically in, intended fundamentally to um to reflect the damages associated with uh, landfilling but also to actually drive the economics of recycling which are generally um they, they generally stand or fall on the cost you avoid by not throwing things away. So the more the cost of throwing things away increases, the more likely local authorities, businesses, industry and so forth, the more likely they are to seek to reduce the amount of waste they generate, to make sure they're recycling what they do generate or reusing it, and to actually minimize the amount of throwing away. And it's increasingly common now in Europe to see uh, incineration also being taxed. We've seen that in, uh, we see the highest rates in Denmark. We also see it in Catalonia and Spain, in the Netherlands. Uh, we used to have it in Sweden and in Norway and um, Belgium as well, Austria. So uh, a wide range of countries starting to introduce taxes on incineration. 
and uh, the Danish one now incidentally related to CO2 emissions. So the um, so the the, 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 the picture is um, the, the, that's a that's a very basic thing that can happen in in most countries. The places where it's less likely to happen are those where costs are going to fall directly on municipalities and hence um, uh, households in those situations where households have very low incomes. So what do we do? Well, in those situations, I think it's important that we start to make sure that producers pay their way and start to internalize those things in order to get those things in the price of what people consume. Now, um, the concept of extended producer responsibility is well known, and there's now increasing uh, interest in... So first of all, I think it's important that producers are... What, like, what, what is it that I think lies behind producer responsibility? For me, for me, in part of the rationale for producer responsibility comes... It's partly related to what Robert was uh, describing earlier. But part of it to me is down to the uh, social license to operate uh, um, on the part of those who are selling us whatever it is that we're consuming. Um, what would happen if, we, if I or other people in the country where I live, or indeed in New York, what would happen if there was no waste collection? And what would happen to the stuff that people were consuming and the packaging that's generated and the stuff that, you know, um, fails to work anymore, that can't be repaired? You have this enormous quantity of stuff that we're generating. And if nobody took it away, then what would we be saying? And I think that it's right that producers um, see a role for themselves in managing the end of life fate of the materials which are a consequence of our consuming their product so i see it i see it in some ways a sort of social license to operate and if you see it in that way then i think it's not unreasonable that producers producers should play a role in um, ensuring that the, the, the products of their of their products and packaging being consumed are well managed and I think the principles that we have here now, which are full cost recovery of the collection of that material, not just in terms of the material that's recycled, but also the stuff that didn't get recycled, it was still in the, the mixed waste, if you like, and recovering the cost of littering, and increasingly trying to make sure that people who put products on the market that are difficult to recycle are actually charged more for doing that than those whose products are designed so that they can be easily recycled. So it becomes another form of economic signal back to the producers that actually right. we don't want you to be putting, and by the way, it's not in your interest, to be putting products onto the market that just can't be recycled. Right. And, and um, um, when it comes to extended producer responsibility, which is also a type of price on pollution, um, um, it's not just extended producer responsibility, is it? it's also extended producer and consumer responsibility because the consumer is also yeah. paying for it. Um, so uh, it's an extended uh, responsibility on everyone in the um, chain, in the in the value chain that's, that's producing or buying the product. So that uh, finally, I mean, this also relates to environmental justice. You know, your choice, your, your choice of product impacting someone else's life somewhere else. Yeah. Um, planet you know whether through uh, climate change or whether through uh, plastic pollution you know which is a big issue now um, so uh, it, it's not just producer responsibility that, that we're talking about here no it is consumers as well and uh, and but of course consumers are then to the extent that those uh, decisions significantly influence price of what's consumed consumers then can choose as it were to make their decisions based upon something that at least nominally reflects uh, something about the environmental impact of, of what they're consuming. It, it would be wrong, I think, to call that necessarily a price on pollution, of course, because it's, it's, you know, that's a slightly more complicated um, and we, we'd have to go back up the, 
uh, the supply chain in a sense to make sure we were taxing the, all of the um, all of the emissions that were associated with production. And that, but, but can I just make a point about that last that yeah. more general point? We've done a lot of studies looking at um, the potential for environmental fiscal reform across the European Union, and you know the average. Um, proportion of GDP that is covered by taxes on things that have an environmental impact is something of the order two and a half percent of GDP and two and a half percent of GDP most European member states have a tax burden that's of the order 40 percent of GDP and if if um, countries start to really you know start to push um, their environmental tax agenda more uh, more firmly as it were then if you look at the sorts of rates that people choose to set those taxes at the moment they get a, get to around four percent of gdp which would be about ten percent of the total tax take now all the other taxes are on profits on income on consumption value-added tax, VAT, and on labour. And you, you've typically got, you know, the, 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 the balance of the, the burden of taxation falls upon those things, none of which we really ought to be um, taxing. You could say VAT is a sort of approximately capturing about consumption but but it, it catches value it doesn't capture the environmental impact uh, of consumption and so one, the, one, of, one of the interesting things I think we also need to explore is as corporations and their you know as they get more footloose and it becomes actually more difficult to, to, to tax the um, whatever it is they're doing shouldn't we be making much stronger efforts to shift the burden of taxation away from labor from profit from uh, um, from income and onto environmental uh, pollution, and um, you can only tax at the level of the externality, at the you know the economists measuring the externalities associated with things. Well, and they say, well, look, we shouldn't we shouldn't tax these pollution these pollutants too heavily because we don't want to go above and beyond their damage cost. But what, how do we set the taxes on, on income and labour? We don't go and say, well, what's the optimal tax on labour? Because arguably the optimal tax on labour would be probably zero. Why do we want to tax people's work? Why do we want to make it more difficult for me as an employer to take on more people? I'd much rather my tax burden came from things that I didn't want <laughs> to see and that I was taxing pollution, uh, whether it be um, not from stationary emitters or particulate matter or carbon dioxide or and and to be honest you know I think we should be much more radical than we've been in looking to really shift the burden of taxation away from uh, away from um, labor profits uh, income and on to pollution and I think that's strongly commensurate with a sort of more circular economy because what it says is it says um, if I've got more labor intense activities where I'm going to uh, manufacture things more carefully and I if I want to make sure I have reuse loops um, where people are going to be using their labor to uh, repair products that have become faulty it's going to be much more difficult if I'm taxing the labour itself and the income of that of that employee, than if I than if I was doing so at a lower rate, and it, right. I'm much more likely to shift production and consumption to less polluting activities if I'm capturing the the the, the um, impact of those and the price of what I'm buying and producing. Right, right. No, it makes total sense. I mean, uh, when you said that um, you would want to tax something that you don't want to see. I mean, labor and employment is something that everyone likes to see. So uh, uh, that was, uh, I think that kind of summarizes. Yeah, I, what, what I meant is I, I don't want to see taxes on the, on the things that I, on the things I want to see encouraged. I want to see them tax less. 
And I think it's quite strange that we've ended up with some economies with really high taxes on uh, labour, um, right. with relatively low taxes on pollution. And uh, I, 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 you know, uh, it's, not, it's not even helpful to stimulate the economy. Mm -hmm. And and um, Dom, so um, just uh, we have only um, five minutes, and we've gotten a lot of questions on carbon trading. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll not be able to ask all the questions, but um, could you touch upon that? What has been your experience, and then you know how does that fit in the price on pollution, uh, you know, discussion that we're having today? Uh, you know, is it being discussed in the circular economy circles, and you know? Yeah, I think I think it's interesting. I mean, my it's it's virtually the unanimous um, call, I would say, in public policy terms, of from those people who are interested in the circular economy. But the challenge is, how do you do it? And I I don't underestimate those challenges because, of course, if you're going to tax, as I was suggesting earlier, for example, the embodied carbon content of say. Um, a computer, then you've got a huge number of different components, some of which may be made from secondary materials, some from primary. How do we do that? I don't think this is going to happen tomorrow, but I think it's something we should, we, we, we're going to have to do it, feels to me. In the, in the era of big data, in the era of um, things that are going into my fridge, being able to talk to uh, something uh, telling me that my um, lettuce is out of date, <laughs> and I need to consume it tomorrow. Uh, it, uh, in the era of that sort of um, complexity, I don't think this is beyond the wit of, our, um, of humanity to, to address. And I think we should start to think about how we're going to go forward in these ways. And, and I suspect it might not, it might not happen for 10 years. I think you can do proxies in between. Like I was saying earlier, you could say, um, what is typically the traded price of carbon, therefore we're going to tax all imported products um, on the basis of an average uh, estimate of the embodied carbon content, unless you, the importer, can show us that your production processes gave rise to a lower level of carbon emissions. And if you can show us that, we'll tax you less of the border. So I think we can do that, and that's uh, as long as we do that in a fair way, that's eligible under WTO rules. Right, right, great. Thank you. And um, so uh, we also got, got a question from Nairobi, um, from uh, Wikisa, and um, I think uh, what um, I think the the question is, so uh, we were talking about uh, production being shifted to um, developing countries. And um, how can we change um, uh, that? How can we change the perception that those are cheap jobs that are going to developing countries from making those are sustainable jobs for you know the entire economy, um, where these jobs could actually um, do environmental good? Um, so I think that's what the question is. So we have a minute to respond and then maybe conclude. Okay, well, I, I mean, I don't think they need to be is the answer, and I and I uh, and I suspect that were we to be making sure we were taxing on basis of consumption rather than production, or just on production, as it were, that um, we would be sending signals back to those people producing in all countries, and, and indeed within our own country, that what we wanted to see was um, the use of cleaner technology in production, and hence um, we'd be consuming products with a lower, should we say, pollution content. And indeed, hopefully, that would give rise to improved conditions in, in the countries themselves. Right, right. And um, uh, based on my experience in the sector, I believe, um, uh, I think a combination of EPR and uh, real price on pollution, you know, which um, accounts for um, the embodied um, emissions, I think that is probably one of the achievements that um, is ahead of us that we should uh, you know all work towards um, getting there because that that will be one of the largest impacts that we can have on on, on the future for, for, for the future generation so um don thanks for joining us today and uh, thanks for your time uh, i know there's been some confusion with the time but thanks for being so accommodating no, cool. no thank you very much for, for yeah. having me and for those who listened in so uh, yeah thanks thanks again Ranjith, for setting this up it's been very fun
Right, great. Thanks. So um, uh, thank you, Dom. So um, see you again. And see you soon. Hopefully we'll do um, Fred, so uh, we've had... Uh, so friends, um, yeah, uh, so we've had uh, more than uh, 230 registrations when I checked last time before um, coming on. So thank you so much for your support. I mean, this really um, helps us. Uh, we've been putting a lot of time into um, uh, making uh, global dialogues on waste and be waste wise work. And um, uh, uh, I mentioned this during the beginning of the session, which is uh, in addition to global dialogues on waste, we also do, uh, we also publish uh, the waste pioneers list and we have interviews and sessions with them um, happening and they're already being published so check them out and additionally um, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm actively seeking employment so what I've learned during this time is that there is no single um, uh, platform or place where we could actually find good uh, uh, in the sector in the waste management and social economy sector so uh, what we're doing is you know, just another drop in the ocean, which is uh, we want to, uh, if you have any job opportunities, then let us know and then we'll put them, uh, we'll uh, publish them in our newsletter and we'll also publish them on our LinkedIn group so that you know you, you could reach more people and then in the long term, this might act as a platform for people who are also looking for jobs. So, um, so if you have any um, such um, opportunities, let us know and then we'll help you. And another thing is, if you're a contributor, if you've been a panelist on Be Waste Wise, you could also use our newsletter as a, we send something called the community newsletter. So if you have any articles written or if you have any updates uh, that you would like people to know about, you know, send them to us and then we will, you know, put them through our newsletter um, uh, and send it to all our subscribers. So um, thank you. And um, I think uh, with this, the live interviews for uh, this theme are over. And we have a pre-recorded interview with um, Alexander Lemel. And um, as soon as uh, we're done on this, I'll send you an email to that, to all, all the people who have registered. So um, I think you should get the email in another uh, five minutes. So um, you'll get a chance to um, watch it entirely. And if you have any questions, since it's a pre-recorded interview, if you have any questions, send it to us, and then we'll get them answered on Twitter or uh, via email. So. Thank you very much, and um, have a have a good day, good night, and um, good evening. And um, see you guys. Thanks. Start recording. Um, so we are recording now. Um, and uh, let me get my introduction. All right. So yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. This is the fifth edition um, of our annual program, the Global Dialogue on Waste, where we bring some of the brightest minds to explore solutions uh, to and through waste management so that all of us could improve well-being on this planet. Um, uh, this is a pre-recorded event um, and therefore uh, there will be no live engagement with the speaker. But if you have any questions, um, tweet, um, tweet them with the, the hashtag waste dialogue, which is W-A-S-T-E, waste dialogue is D-I-A-L-O-G, the American um, spelling. Um, or write to us at um, connect at wastewise.be and we will get your questions and comments answered. Now, this is the fourth event under the theme Beyond a Circular Economy, uh, where we are bringing practitioners and thought leaders from around the world to, um, to contribute uh, to a robust vision uh, for the circular economy. And um, today we have with us um, Alexander Lemel. Um, he is the founder of a circular economy um, consulting company called Wise Impact. And uh, through his uh, various publications, he argues that uh, poverty is the real waste. And therefore, if circular economy aims to address waste, then it should address poverty. And it is also a belief at Be Waste Wise that um, for circular economy to become a new economic paradigm, um, by replacing the existing system, then it should address issues like poverty, like um, issues like unequal distribution of wealth and um, consumption and price on pollution. So we've discussed these issues earlier in, in this um, uh, through live events. And this one in this pre-recorded event, we'll be discussing about poverty and inequality. 
And um, hello, Alex. Uh, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Ways. Great to have you again. Uh, hello, Ranjit. Thanks for having me. Um, where are you joining from, Alex? Uh, where are you right now? Uh, right now, I'm uh, from uh, joining you from Northern France in Europe. OK. Uh, what are you doing there? Well, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing uh, business development there. And uh, the, the, the core of my business, which is mainly uh, impact assessment and uh, putting value on, on change uh, in projects, be it uh, linear or circular projects. Uh, Today. Right. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Um, so, um, Alex, could you tell us about a little bit about um, where you're coming from, what your work is, and you know how you got into the circular economy movement, um, and um, and why you write so many articles on you know um, the inclusive um, for, for the circular economy on being more inclusive. What, what's the background for you know your um, fascination with poverty and why you, why you do this? Well, uh, the, the, the background I started uh, back in the years where I was at Cisco Systems and uh, based in, in Dubai, uh, where I saw the extreme capitalism system and uh, all the hidden, uh, the, the, the hidden issues that was uh, generated by having such a footprint uh, on the planet uh, because by, by living in a country uh, that use uh, yet that use approximately uh, six to seven planets uh, per year uh, to enjoy the life uh, we were we used to enjoy there so i started the journey with an mba which i uh, which i did uh, partly in boston in uh, massachusetts uh, usa uh, with electives in social innovation and uh, corporate social responsibility. I then became uh, an official trainer in those spaces and I was part of a social entrepreneurship uh, association. Um, but at the end of the day, I was not very happy with, with this concept because we needed to prove uh, that a social enterprise was really uh, making a difference on society and we, uh, I, I saw that the corporate social responsibility angle of uh, the business was mainly a, a press release exercise uh, other than really making the change. And when Cisco System decided to become the first funding organization to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, I had the opportunity to be part of some uh, uh, web conferences and, uh, and meetings with uh, Dame Ellen MacArthur and, and then I saw a really systemic uh, concept uh, that was really aiming at, at changing the way we do business today. So that's how I started back in 2011. Right. Um, so why poverty? Why your fascination with poverty? I mean, you um, make a point to mention that, um, you know, in all your articles and all your talks. Well, um, Besides Dubai, because Dubai was not the only experience I had, uh, I have lived extensively uh, in Africa. Uh, I have been traveling a lot for business and leisure in uh, in Asia, in the Middle East, and in uh, in Africa. And not the standard business uh, tourism, sorry, but uh, rather uh, uh, meeting with people and and going uh, going to meet the people and to see what's going on in each country I was traveling uh, in. And uh, to to be very surprised to see some big famous names and employing people uh, that were barely uh, living a decent life. And in social innovation and in the, the, the traditional triple bottom line, which is not exactly the bottom line that we we should be aiming at today by splitting it in silos between the social, the environmental and, and the economic, but rather uh, a complete bottom line uh, which needs to be addressed in, in one go. You, you cannot separate the environmental from the social and the economic. Um, I, I realized that uh, the way we were living in Western countries uh, was the wrong concept and was, the, was having a very negative impact on, on, on emerging economies and keeping some people uh, in poverty while uh, we were enjoying a, a very decent life. And 
out of this triple bottom line, I'm the social guy. And the circular economy, to me, uh, should you be claiming the circular economy to be our next economic model? Then it has to be providing uh, hope for all of us. We live in this linear uh, mindset where we are satisfied with the 1% owning nine, uh, the wealth equivalent to the rest of the 99% of the population of this world. And we seem to be continuing that mindset uh, in a circular economy as we, as we discuss it today with, by providing all the tools to the, the powerful uh, people and companies of this world. This is not a critique here. I'm just saying we need to be careful and we need to make sure that this new economic model has a social dimension. And why poverty? Well, basically, uh, if you understand well the butterfly diagram, the waste and the eradication of waste is at the center of the diagram between the, the biosphere and the technosphere. Therefore, we also need to address uh, the social dimension by starting with poverty at the center of the same diagram and by finding uh, strategies to also uh, embed the social dimension and, and eradicate poverty. I'm not saying this, is, this can be done very easily. I'm just saying in the business decision process, when we think about eradicating waste, and when we think about implementing business models as a service, uh, mainly the performance economy, we need to understand how human beings uh, could play a critical role uh, by developing technologies that do not replace uh, human manpower, but that uh, emphasizes uh, this human manpower so that we can enjoy all kinds of activities that we will be re rewarding the people on this planet. I'm not saying it's going to be jobs like eight to five as we know them today, but I'm saying this is, this, these are going to be rewarding based activities whereby manpower will be preferred over technologies at all costs. That's the, that's the reasoning behind circular economy 2.0. Right. right. So um, if I um, hear what you're saying, um, as, as someone who's been consulting for World Bank, I mean, I do come across poverty quite a bit. Uh, I think that's quite privileged because I'm coming across poverty not as someone who's experiencing it. But someone who's you know um, working on different environmental projects to solve it. Um, so um, and um, and one thing I wanted to mention uh, when you were talking about Dubai was that um, you see all the flashy side of Dubai on one side. That's that's what most of us see. But then on the other side, it's um, the labor camps and the amount of poverty and the number, the amount of exploitation that happens to be able to have this flashy um, lifestyle in Dubai, that's kind of generally not seen. And um, and if uh, so, so uh, that was one of my comments on, on Dubai. And that kind of shows what kind of economic systems that we are in right now, the existing economic system that we are in. And if I hear you, um, what you're saying is that um, thanks to the foundation, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, you believe that circular economy would be the next economic paradigm. And if that's going to be the case, then um, you want to make sure that it may, uh, it also addresses the social um, issues like poverty. So it, that's where you're coming from, and and which is why you say that it's not a critique, just like you know this this yeah. theme that we're organizing here, but it's a way to make the vision more robust. Um, yeah, you you have you have two missing dimension in when I'm when I express the fact that the concept is great. Uh, the circular thinking is great. Uh, this is the way to go, uh, except that it's not bold enough. It does because we we fear uh, we fear businesses. We 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 are still in our linear thinking, uh, whereby we rely on the big businesses to start kicking off that new economic model. But circular economy is a distributed economy, so it's like the sun. It's distributed. Everybody can enjoy uh, uh, technology based on uh, sun power, 
but prefer be, uh, much, much better would be uh, replicating uh, the photosynthesis uh, by natural biological uh, systems. What I'm saying is that we therefore need to address the two missing dimension of a systemic economic model, which is include everyone as part of this economic model, moving completely away from the linear thinking. So that's one, the social dimension is missing and we need to embed uh, business, circular business models by including uh, all the people when we design those models. And I will explain how uh, in a minute. And the second missing dimension is that we need to move away from our currency-based system into a value-based system. I mean, Polanyi, the famous economist uh, uh, earlier in this century, was explaining that the, the needs of the people needs to supersede uh, the, economic, the economy. So the social needs need to drive the economy and not the other way around. And by addressing the needs of the people so that they are satisfied and they don't need to consume more, uh, we could maybe avoid the rebound that uh, two, uh, two experts just issued in a report uh, a few weeks ago called uh, Circular Economy Rebound, whereby they say that in three quarters of the cases, uh, there, will be a, there will be a rebound. So we will be consuming more in a circular economy. Why? Because we still have this objective of developing uh, pr primary production and secondary production in parallel instead of uh, focusing on exclusive circular uh, production which is service-based production you use a product as a service in such a way that we keep that product the longest way possible in the economy uh, in order to reduce the, our consumption and right now the big guys are not advising to reduce consumption that's right. unfortunate that's uh, that's that's the way it is Right. So um, this reminds me of a difficult question that I always have to deal with um, and um, which is related to the increase in efficiencies when, you know, you have some kind of environmental models and it also has to, got to do with um, prices. Um, like you mentioned, you know, um, uh, they estimate, uh, they, they expect that there will be a rebound in you know consumption because uh, if we go with more efficient processes but then doing more uh, doing whatever we're doing right now more efficiently is a way in which we can you know improve the environment so uh, we come to a paradox where um what happens is if we have to provide services to more people then the services have to become cheaper right and uh, the products have to become more cheaper but then once that happens because of uh, improvements in uh, environmental uh, processes if that happens then all of a sudden the consumption increases and consumption as you know along with the population growth rate these uh, those two are the largest uh, one of the main drivers for all other anthropogenic uh, uh, changes on, on this planet so it comes to a paradox where you can't you either have to keep the price high um, or you have to um, like compromise on one of those things I mean do you ever think about it in this way am I thinking in the right way or should I be thinking about this in a different point of view like what are your thoughts on this yeah uh, my thoughts on this is that efficiency is is great uh, we understand efficiency very well in a linear economy but what we forget is effectiveness the, the concept of effectiveness is that what we will do in a circular economy will come back again and again to satisfy the needs of the people to satisfy the needs of the society to increase well-being by effectiveness you, you just imagine your uh, sustainability loop, the endless loop. So let's take again the example of the sun, the, the, or the example of, of the, the, the water system, or it comes back again and again. The, the sun is available, the sun energy is available every day. So that's effectiveness of your system. You need to replicate the natural cycles 
Therefore, if you follow the, the cycles and if you develop bio-based or technological-based solutions, you will not increase the consumption because you are based on, you, you mimic uh, natural cycles that comes back again and again. And that's effectiveness of the system associated with efficiency. Then you have, you have the, the right solution whereby you satisfy the needs of the people without putting more pressure on planet Earth because these elements are coming back again and again. And, I'm, and I know it's difficult in a fossil fuel and fossil based economy to understand that. But if you look at nature and how natural cycles uh, operates, uh, this is the way this is the way we are. We should be doing. There is a great uh, example of a company called Glowy. Mm -hmm. And Glowy is based on uh, luminescent uh, technology, whereby they are now able to, I believe, uh, light, lighting up uh, shops for uh, eight days in a row uh, with natural uh, lights. So all of a sudden, you move away completely from a fossil fuel mindset into a natural light, which is available endlessly. So your consumption should we should be able to think about consumption this way uh, by replicating uh, what we can learn from nature as one way right. another concept would be the performance economy based on walter stahel uh, concept whereby you grant access to the same product that product for vip customers like you and me uh, can evolve with the technology okay uh, your washing machine can evolve uh, through the year, so you are VIP customers. You access the machine and you pay it per wash, and that machine technology evolves through the years. Remember that technology, there are few rules to, uh, to use technologies in a circular economy. It has to absorb uh, CO2 emission. It has to reduce uh, uh, our footprint in, in such a way that we we can use that those technologies in closed loop without having putting pressure on resources, um, and right. once once we uh, and we can access those 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 machines uh, those products as a service, but for other people who cannot afford those those services, you can imagine those machines uh, technologies not evolving as fast as it sh it would with us. Uh, and therefore decreasing the price of access to those technologies that in such a way your big machine brands in the world uh, now have these machines available uh, with the priority with the objective of including more people into your economy so therefore even those machines as a service they have been paid so many times over so many years that they could be now offered at a minimum price because the priority here is to include more people in your uh, economy uh, to avoid uh, all the negative externalities, uh, social externalities that we, we have to take into account uh, nowadays. Right, right. So um, you're talking about a service economy and uh, during our test room we also talked about this. Um, this is a model which is similar to um, drug companies um, where um, in at least um, I know in India um, drug companies can uh, pro uh, produce a drug with a patent on it for about, I think, 10 years. And after that, the patent, um, and after that, other companies can produce the same drug at a much uh, smaller cost and make it more, much more widely available. Uh, but I want to slightly um, uh, change gears here and then um, talk about uh, uh, talk about the status of you know what's happening in circular economy. Uh, you've been very involved in this um, sector, so um, I know. The, the, so all of us know that the circular economy has gained a lot of traction, and um, a lot of companies have shown um, interest and support. Um, do you know? Uh, you know what's the status of implementation when it comes to implementing? What's the status? What do you see happening around the world, and who who's doing anything, or who's doing better, or you mean the status of implementation of circular economy project around the world, right? Uh, the concept of circular economy around the world. Or... Well, the concept of circular economy around the world is definitely gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a launch in, uh, in India. You just mentioned India six months ago by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, 
they are, they are now uh, circular economy uh, conference events, uh, co-working groups, uh, I would say in, the, in all five continents, uh, including Latin America and Africa. Uh, lately, there was the first uh, circular economy conference in, in South Africa back in May, and the first one in Latin America next week uh, in, in Uruguay. So the momentum is there. The thing is that it's like the, the industrial economy. It has all started uh, in the UK or in the Western world. Um, so that's that so far has been developed by a Western mindset, uh, which is which is fine to me. But the circular economy needs to address the needs of emerging uh, economies as well, because we are still in that paradigm of competition over resources instead of collaboration. And we will definitely have to change that uh, mindset. And we will have also to change the fact that the Western economies are the model to follow uh, in the next century. Uh, the emerging economies are the societies that have understood to me, to my point of view, uh, a great way of keeping uh, some great well-being and some uh, traditions. And in Africa, for instance, most of the economies are below uh, the global footprint of 2.8 uh, global hectare per, per habitant. And to me, it's a great, great advantage next to the way they collaborate between, between themselves. They have understood it all. So these two factors might see uh, continents like Africa or like Asia uh, much faster in your circular economic mindset than the Western economies that have to learn how to live in, the, in collaboratively away from uh, competing at all costs. So we see a lot of, of examples. Uh, in Asia, the, uh, the ASEAN, ASEAN organization has issued a lot of examples uh, of what's happening in circular economy across uh, across Asia. Uh, in Latin America, you now have two major conferences uh, organized uh, in the coming months. So things are happening. Uh, Tier Fund, the NGO in the UK, has issued some example uh, to fight uh, poverty and to include the social dimension in the circular economic concept with business cases from Brazil, from Africa. So it's gaining momentum. But what I'm saying is that we need to have this systemic view and we need to embed it all. And what I've been suggesting in that concept is maybe to, next to the biosphere and next to the technosphere, to include a human sphere where we will define the role of human being in that, in that next economy. Mm -hmm. So that we ensure that before jumping into uh, artificial intelligence and before jumping into the next, we believe will save the world, um, we tend to forget that it, it puts more pressure on resources, no matter what. Uh, instead, if you use human as a service and if you use human as resources to maintain the biosphere and to enhance the biosphere, to maintain the technosphere and to improve it, uh, therefore you increase the role of human being in your next economic model and you you think about the human sphere before moving into uh, how the technosphere will will sort us out and how the humans are going to a bit like the model that was taken in the book um, uh, cradle to cradle with the ant the ants uh, that weight more than the than you, all human beings put together and the ants are rebuilding the biosphere they have no negative impact on the biosphere they are instead rebuilding it how can we transform humans and human activities so that it could rebuild the biosphere and as well as preserving the technosphere? One great example is those ladies in China that are pollinating by hand uh, all the fruit trees in, uh, in the Sichuan uh, regions of China. That's a basic example, but that's a great example of replacing the bees that we have uh, killed by our uh, our uh, pesticides and, and all the processes that, uh, that we've implemented in the linear economy. While we are rebuilding the, the population of bees, how the humans can preserve that biosphere, fixing it, 
why we are trying to uh, to fix the population of bees. That that's that's a great example. So beyond that that example, how can we join deal you this uh, Chinese American uh, 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 filmmaker and uh, and permaculture expert? has rebuilt, uh, has uh, recreated uh, ecosystems in desert, uh, turning them into lush, uh, lush forest with rivers. So we can rebuild the biosphere from the human by the human. So this is possible. So integrating that human sphere uh, into the butterfly diagram would be, in my view, a way to understand how we can enhance the role of humans in that next economic model before jumping into technology will save us all. And that's also a way to, as we said earlier in this uh, discussion, to see uh, how to use, uh, to optimize all the resources, including the human resources, to fix our economy and to fix our planet uh, while eradicating, seeing the end of poverty together with seeing the end of, uh, of waste. Right, so um, that, that um, brings me to a point which we've been making on um, the global dialogue so through Be Waste Wise um, in the past four and a half years. And uh, I'm an engineer, I, you know, I work with technology all the time. But then um, we say that technology does not, like, like you said, you know, does not um, solve or does not end uh, or does not save the human, human race or uh, life on, on this planet. Because um, it is, after all, uh, it, uh, it is after all a tool, and it will help us do something faster, better, more efficiently. But then it itself does not have a um, intention, or um, it depends on the person or the group of efficiently, people. but not effectively. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So um, it, it does not. Um, uh, it depends on the person or the group of people who are using that technology on what the technology finally does. Um, so uh, we are at this point, I think, looking for uh, a shift in how we think about resources, and, um, a shift in, uh, in the, our mind frameworks on how we think about uh, our planet and well-being. Um, so let me ask you um, about you. Uh, so we've talked about the theory on how um, you know what we should do and how we should include poverty in the circular economy framework. But do you have any examples on uh, how this could be done? Like, do you have any examples from your work where you know, let's say, there is a business which is trying to be more circular in their uh, supply chains or in the, in their materials and using their materials, but how you could include the human uh, aspect? Um, to it, do you have any examples that uh, you could, you know, help our listeners understand what you're saying? Well, the, um, in terms of the best examples, I mean, just uh, just at my at my company level, uh, it's difficult to to address these these major topic uh, just by myself. But uh, I'm just suggesting here that there is a way to be a bit bolder in the the way we think about circular economy and the next the next model. Uh, in terms of example, the best examples today are the ones published in the two reports from Tier Fund, uh, that NGO, and that has a report called uh, the Cl closing the loop, and I can send you uh, send you the references and the the, the report themselves. One is called closing the loop, and uh, the other one is called the virtuous uh, circle. This is, to my knowledge, the two reports focusing on cir how circular economy could uh, eradicate uh, poverty, or at least have a huge impact on societies across the world. Um, so that's that's for the examples. Uh, in terms of uh, my work and where this is all going, well, my work is mainly on measuring projects, services, and possibly products uh, impact on society. Okay, I, I work on impact assessment uh, report, and I put a value on change. Whether you have a linear product compared to a circular uh, services, uh, how that circular services will enhance society. How are we going to be satisfied uh, by that circular services 
what, uh, whether that circular services will generate more well-being uh, to the targeted population. That's that's the work I do. What kind of metrics do you obviously, use? To the, met the metric, obviously, I, I work more on linear project than circular projects today, but the conclusion of these reports always tend to help uh, the designer of those projects and programs to focus more on circularity. Uh, in terms of metrics, well, there are many metrics available out there, so I don't need to recreate the metrics. Uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation issued some metrics. Uh, other designers and, uh, and organizations have issued uh, circular economy uh, indicators. So these indicators are there, available. But I don't come up with a, uh, a wallet full of indicators because it doesn't work that way. You need to first understand what the beneficiary of your services or the customers, the employees, the citizen of your services, the way they react to your services, whether it generates uh, better well-being, uh, better satisfaction, more confidence, uh, less consumption patterns, and so on and so forth, whether it addresses their needs. So once you un understand uh, what type of change is happening on, the, on your targeted population, then you list potential indicators. So often they are quantitative indicators, but we need as well uh, to list qualitative indicators. So whether you are more satisfied with the circular service as it is designed today, what kind of, of change does it create uh, in your daily life? So it's, it has to do a lot to do with qualitative uh, outcomes. And once we understand those outcomes, we list as many indicators, quantitative and qualitative as possible. So you pick them up from circular economic indicators that have been designed by experts, but you also pick them up from well-being indicators and qualitative indicators. And once you have proven that change, that change is really happening, that that circular project is generating more well-being and more satisfaction than the linear uh, product and on top of that it has a lesser footprint and it, it, it is based on the circular economic principles and I, al I also have suggested to list uh, a list of outcomes, priority outcomes based on the butterfly diagram which is available uh, on, on LinkedIn, it's called optimizing circular value. So once you understand all those priority outcomes you put measurement uh, indicators in front of them, you prove that they, they are happening that circular economic rebound is avoided, that satisfaction has increased, and then you, you apply a value uh, on that change. So what we do is that we, we estimate the opportunity cost, avoided cost, all the externalities that are, uh, that are monetized, and we explain to management of companies, to governmental teams, that these services is providing these benefits is avoiding this kind of rebound, is diminishing the, the consumption overall. And we provide as well ways to uh, redesign uh, that, that service or programs uh, in, the, in the future by uh, doing a sensitivity analysis now that we have a lot of data available. So that's, that's how we do it. Right now, one final question is, um, so uh, for circular economy to work, I mean, businesses, I mean, it started as a business movement. I mean, businesses are, should be a uh, um, part of it. But um, when it comes to, um, so for, if a CEO of a business, if, if he has to um, um, convince his shareholders that, you know, this is a path that we should take, then, you know, what are the drivers um, that a company would do something like this? I, I know savings could be a big driver, but are we there yet where uh, taking these steps would create a lot of savings for the company? And um, also, in addition to savings, what are the drivers that a CEO could, uh, you know, factors that a CEO could use to convince their shareholders, you know, uh, who are mainly investing in the, in the company mostly for... Yeah, the, the, the savings mindset uh, is obviously the, the mindset we, we see today in a, in a linear economy where we try to, uh, to reduce cost as much as we can and sell, uh, sell as many products as we, as we can. That's, that's your uh, output, uh, output process. 
but um, uh, the in your circular economy the advantage is that now it's not about saving uh, the last penny it's about innovating it's about how am i going to shift around my business model how am i going to turn on its head uh, the way my organization functions in order to innovate and to innovate together with other companies so that i come up with a collaborative uh, solution to externalities environmental externalities social externalities so that we can innovate and come up with a solution that removes those externalities from, uh, from the system. Those externalities could be a threat uh, to the existence of businesses. So circular economy is about explaining to businesses uh, the best way uh, to save businesses uh, from, from disappearing. That's as simple as that. If you continue putting pressure on the planet the way we do it, in a, with, uh, by adding three, three more billion consumers uh, that will all want to live that uh, lush life uh, that we see on TV, and therefore we will put so much pressure on the, uh, on the earth that at the end of the day, your businesses will run out of water, will run out of uh, fossil uh, to, 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 to make the product and uh, we run out of energy. So if you don't come up with this mindset shift of circular thinking by saying, how am I going to address the next ex externality? How am I going to address my water supply in an effective way and my energy supply differently from the fossil fuel mindset? Uh, your, your business might well be uh, disappearing. So yeah. it's not only uh, it's not only a concept that generates so many innovation for the future of your company, right. it's also a survival concept. Yeah, so uh, this, this works for um, large um, companies, you know, which have uh, um, uh, interest in um, staying, uh, staying in business for, you know, um, hundreds of years. Uh, but um, how does it work uh, for small and medium enterprises who are, who are dealing with much different challenges? I mean, uh, they're actually thinking about next month, next, you know, getting revenues in the short term so that they could survive um, longer. So um, what kind of drivers or what's happening in the small and medium um, business sector with, with respect to circular economy and what they could do? So we have only five more minutes. So, you know, um, you could uh, maybe answer to this question about small and medium enterprises and circular economy. And also have, if you have any conclusions, you know, you could uh, conclude with those. So basically, I mean, you have a lot of startups uh, that jump straight into the circular economic uh, models. So they, these are very dynamic uh, startups like uh, Bundle in the Netherlands uh, that just come up with a, a, a service-based solution uh, to turn a product into a service. So these are great concepts and these are very fast solution that are shaking up uh, the industry and these, these are good news. Uh, obviously, the large companies are, are already being addressed by uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the, the World Economic Forum. These are large organizations helping those large companies uh, figure out how to innovate uh, in, the, in this next economy. The SMMEs are not being addressed as we speak. There is no organization, to my knowledge, or very few only, that help the SMMEs uh, address, uh, embrace this next economic model. And we need, we need an organization, be it uh, at national or in international level, that drives those uh, small to medium-sized uh, enterprises to talk to each other, to collaborate between each other, and to come up with comprehensive uh, service-based solutions so that they can create and address uh, the consumer needs uh, in, in clever ways by saying, I'm missing that, that piece of the puzzle uh, in order to offer uh, the service to my, uh, to my consumer, or I'm, I'm missing uh, one technology or one solution. Can we, can we work together? Uh, with different comprehensive solutions so that uh, put together this could be a very innovative uh, new approach. So the SMMEs, the advantage of the SMMEs is that they are locally based. So in a distributed economy, 
this is what we want and that's what we, we need. So the circular economy is the economy of so small to medium sized enterprise, but today they are not being helped to uh, flourish in such an, an economy. So that's in my view missing. Mm -hmm. And that's in my view, the solution, the, the foundation to our uh, next economic model. That's gonna be a localized, uh, localized enterprise delivering a service to the to the urban uh, hub uh, instantly basically so that's uh, that's missing unfortunately but collaboration is the key uh, the key element here for smmes and there is there is a need of having an, this organization as a glue to put uh, the right the right smmes to talk to each other like we do in industrial uh, ecology and symbiosis basically right the same same approach Right. Great. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that days, this circular economic model brings, brings us hope because we see a lot of uh, surveys about the CO2 pressure, the recent surveys saying that there is 1% chance to, uh, to be uh, below the 1.5 degree at the end of the century, 5% uh, below 2 degrees. We all know that at 2 degrees, the, the world will be... Uh, will be a very, uh, very difficult place to, to live in. Uh, and if you have children, uh, they will turn uh, 70, 75 by the end of this century. And therefore, uh, your children will not be able to, to live that life that uh, we all enjoyed so far. So circular economy brings proper answers to reducing CO2 pressure by innovating, by thinking circularly, what I'm just saying is that we need to be careful that circular economy is designed for every single human being on this planet. We are all hearing uh, by the big international organization that the future is about a jobless growth. These are two terrible worlds. The future is not about jobless growth. The future is about advancement, human advancement, and it's about how to find ways to use human as a resource, as energy, as service, so that we can all live a very well-being uh, and enjoyable life. And jobless growth is not going to be the future we all wish to have, because those who are saying that are just thinking that technology will save us all. Again, we are running out of resources, so technologies are based on those resources. Therefore, this is a limited way of thinking. On the other hand, we have plenty of people. We are going to 10 plus billion people in this planet. So how are we going to use the, them as energy and services and resources to fix uh, the, the many challenges that we foresee uh, by the end of the century? So that's, I believe, Another dimension that we need to think together with being measured against value creation. And that's, that's if, you, if you manage to embrace these two, two additional dimensions, you have now a future with a lot of hope. And it maybe sounds a bit utopian, but we all need a bit of utopia in our life. Uh, but if you understand biomimicry, natural cycles, permaculture, blue economy uh, very well, the, and the regenerative economy, especially how do you regenerate uh, resources? You can hear what I'm saying about using human more intelligently. And one great example uh, to end this conversation is the X tax project, which is asking governments, it's starting in Europe, but hopefully it will uh, spread across the world, to remove tax on manpower or to at least diminish uh, dramatically tax on manpower and to increase tax on fossil fuel and fossil based uh, products. And that's to me one great pathway towards this circular economy 2.0 concept. Great. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, so um, th this reminds me of something. Um, I, I uh, always, um, I think when I was really young in my teenage, uh, teenage years, um, I think back then I knew that I wanted to be in the environmental field um, because uh, when uh, in my teenager years, I was still part of the future generation for, at that point of time. 
but I was already thinking about my future generations and you know what will happen to them. Uh, and um, I always wanted to be in the environmental field, and I think I'm living my dream now. So you know, I'm an environmental consultant. And um, as part of this, I spent, um, I worked um, for quite a while in Abu Dhabi, um, not very far from Dubai, where where you worked, and um, and my work there i mean abu dhabi i mean it just blew my mind when i went there i mean it's so amazing you know so um the hotels or the everything that they do is just so amazing it, it just blew my mind the buildings and everything and um and my work was um i go to different companies and then audit them for their uh, environmental footprint for their waste footprint and then um, see you know what kind of footprint they are having, how they could reduce costs, how they could um, reduce their footprint on the environment, and uh, that was my job. And as part of the job, um, I also looked at, um, for example, construction companies, and um, and we also uh, when looking when when performing an audit of the construction company, we also had to look at all of their facilities, and some of their facilities also included um, labor camps. So um, uh, I also used to visit labor camps quite often uh, to audit, the, you know, the construction facilities and the living conditions there. I'm not sure if you've ever been to one of them, but the living conditions there are um, terrible. You, you just can't imagine. And these are immigrants from some other country coming to this country to work there. And these companies are um, have them living in those conditions. And um, I used to keep thinking, so I'm working on waste management, I'm working on environmental impact. So let's imagine, now let's just conduct a thought experiment, right? So let's imagine Abu Dhabi um, transitions from fossil fuels to um, renewable energy, um, which there is a huge potential for it to do that. Um, but um, it looks like the, 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 the speed is not as fast as we, we expected while I was there. But still, let's let's consider that um, Abu Dhabi uh, or the entire UAE moves to renewable energy, and then the systems, the material flows are much more circular. Let's assume. Let's get to that point. And now, in that situation, in that uh, utopian future, if that was happening, and the people who are working on this were still living in labor camps, you know, is that a future that you know we would like to be a part of? You know, I started as an environmental consultant. That would be the best. Uh, well, the part where there are circular flows and renewable energy, that would be the best future that I could hope for. But then on the other hand, um, people are not living in very good conditions. The people who built all of this are not living in very good conditions. So, uh, I mean, that's the question that keeps, uh, you know, um, uh, keeps uh, turning me more towards not just being an environmental consultant, but also being very conscious of the societal impacts that we're having and, you know, what kind of future that we need. And I think this is a question that all of us should ask whether that is a future that we want to actually live in. And um, some of them, some of us might think that, you know, oh, Abu Dhabi is uh, an extreme example. And it is an extreme example of our current system. But then um, if you actually look at, um, look at it, look at what we're doing around the world, it is just the extreme example. Um, not very different from what we're doing, but it's just the extreme. So we're all doing it and we have to really think about um, how we do this and what kind of future that, um, yeah. so yeah, with that, I think, um, yeah, we are out of time. I, I, I wasn't expecting this towards the end, so. Okay, no, yeah. just just to, to address your point, I mean, Abu Dhabi, Dubai are uh, the example that you, you just mentioned, but the thing is that you make other other cities dream to be like Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and Lagos wants to be like Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Cairo wants to be like Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and you name it. I mean, the number of cities who, which wants to be like Abu Dhabi and Dubai, Addis Ababa. But imagine billions of African, Asian, Latin Americans who wants to be like Dubai. I mean, where are we going to end up this way? So instead let's make sure that these collaborative societies show the way to the rest of the world how to collaborate how to live uh, a decent life uh, by by sharing uh, resources by using and optimizing all these resources 
in clever ways by reinventing uh, the next economic model based on the circular thinking, but not to forget the social dimension because Europe will move fast in a circular economic model. That's fine for the VIP uh, people, uh, the citizens of Europe, but, um, but they will still see those migrants, economic migrants coming to Europe and not understand the relation between the way they, cons the, the, they consume and why we have so many uh, Africans and uh, people from the Middle East migrating to Europe. There is a disconnect and that disconnect needs to be fixed if we want circular economy to be the next economic model. Right, great. Um, I think we should end um, the session here. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, certain people, when we're, we're all really busy people, you know, working on our areas of expertise, and certain people say, oh, so should circular economy also worry about all these other problems when we are doing trying to do something else? And this was a question that I asked to one of our uh, future uh, panelists, uh, Olivia Lapierre. She talks about how uh, the conversation on environmental sustainability should be more diverse, should also include the populations which will be more affected by um, such uh, uh, by climate change. And I asked the same question. So we're already working on all these other issues. So, so should we also talk about, uh, should we also worry about representation of different populations? And then she says, you don't have to really choose between identities. Like, you know, if you're, uh, 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 if you're an environmental engineer, it doesn't mean that you stop being an Indian, an immigrant in a different country. So, um, so I thought that was really interesting, and I think we should all, like you know, don't have to choose between different uh, identities or different visions. Yeah. No, you you need to address address the needs of the people uh, to make sure that the people are, are are satisfied with their life where they are. Okay fixing the population where they are. I mean, if they, the population wants to move, they, they, they want to move, but as long as it's it's not an economic move or a poverty-based move. Uh, addressing the needs of the people and in such a way that it's effective, i.e. there is no more footprint. We uh, develop solution that addresses the needs of the people without having any externalities uh, and moving us away. The footprint concept is a linear concept. Uh, in circular economy, since you are in a regenerative economic model, there's no more footprint. So you satisfy the needs of the people in an effective way, in an efficient way, so that they it's constantly regenerative. You constantly bring them water, food, uh, energy based on renewable systems that not only are renewable but provide even more abundance like like in nature if you if you if you leave your garden uh, without being maintained nature will take over and uh, the the insects and the, the 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 trees will come back so mm -hmm. abundance exists in nature and we don't understand that as human being and there is a way to do that obviously it will take time to reach that um, abundance and regenerative level but we need to start right right yeah great um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, thanks for your um, extra time. Uh, this discussion did um, go a little longer than expected. So um, we will try to um, publish the entire discussion, but um, uh, in case if you have to edit, we will um, let you know uh, what parts will be edited. So yeah, great. Thank you, Alex. Um, thanks everyone for listening. And if you have any questions, this is a pre-recorded interview, so you'll not be able to engage live with the speaker. But if you have any questions, um, tweet to us with the hashtag waste dialogue. Waste Dialog is W-A-S-T-E-D-I-A-L-O-G. Or you could also write to us at uh, connect at wastewise.be and we'll get your questions and comments answered. So thank you again. And um, please uh, watch the other, um, please uh, make sure you register for the other um, themes that are happening, which are practicing waste management um, and also collective action. Um, so yeah, thank you very much and uh, have a good day, good evening, good night. Thank you.